God, I feel old. <laughs> anyway, I'll just let you get to your seats a second. Uh, I called this talk Perfect Pitch. When I saw that I only had, um, I think it's 15 minutes to talk, I thought, um, I thought there was meant to be a counter on here to warn me. But that's all right, I've got Simon and Garfunkel to shout me off in a little while. Um, I tried to think of how to condense 30 years into 15 minutes. And I thought the easiest way of doing it is to give you a little bit of background of how I ended up in the situation I got into in the police, and then show you an example of how I tried to apply the kind of stuff that you guys all believe in and work in, and trying to bring it into an organization like the police, which is very, very, very old-fashioned in a lot of the ways it uh, approaches things. Um, the first thing I should say is uh, I joined the police for the most noble of reasons. Um, because it was a bet. And I was, <laughs> I was 18 at the time, it was 1979. I didn't really know what I was going to do in my life. I buggered up my education completely because I was a little bit ASD and my teachers didn't know how to teach me. That's the story I tell. Um, but the fact was, I, I ended up at the end of the sixth form with one A level, hardly any O levels, um, sort of GCSE equivalents, nothing like that. And I didn't know what to do with my life. Now, when you went to see the careers teacher, I grew up in Cornwall, as you might tell occasionally with a little burr in the accent. It comes out in words like accent, and it comes out in words like cow. <laughs> but uh, I grew up in Cornwall, the poorest county in England. Um, people don't realise this when they go on holiday and enjoy the beaches, but it's an appalling place in the winter. Once all the tourism's gone for six months, there's almost no work. All the local industries, the, the, the traditional industries have all gone. And I grew up there in the 1960s and the 70s, and when I started going to see the careers teacher, in the mid-70s, invariably his advice was, get out of Cornwall. That was the career's advice. And the way you did that was if you were a young woman, it was get married to someone. And if you were a bloke, it was join the Navy or go to college or university or somehow get out of Cornwall. Because there was nothing for you. There was nothing for you. The mines had gone, the fishing industry had been stripped back to almost nothing. Um, and a lot of the other traditional industries in Cornwall had gone. All that was on the rise was tourism, but it's very, very seasonal. So I thought, how the hell am I going to get out of Cornwall? And at the time, I was toying with going to catering college, because at the time, I was working, I was, I was training as a chef at a restaurant at the time. And I also thought about going to art college, because I had a quite a good portfolio, and uh, a local technical college had said they'd take me on for a foundation year, which would possibly lead to going on to a poly later on, back in the days when we had polys, when everything wasn't universities. Anyway, came to around my 18th birthday, and my dad, who was a police officer who particularly specialised in homicide, get a lot of those in Cornwall, um, well, you say that, but the Devon and Cornwall Police is one body. And if you think of the size of Devon, you think of the size of Cornwall, that's one police force area. It's massive. And Plymouth does have its fair few homicides and serious, serious assaults. It's mostly sailors killing each other, but, it's, but nevertheless, they, they do have a lot of problems. And he would quite often go off to, on homicide investigations that would take him away from the house. We live right down the end near Land's End, you know, right down the end where it's, you know, it's very gimme six, you know, that sort of place. Um, <laughs> And it's, uh, he would quite often be away from home for, you know, weeks on end because he couldn't commute every day because Plymouth was like 75 miles away from where we lived. Exeter, if something happened in Exeter, that was 150 miles away from where we lived, but still in the same police force area. But anyway, came to my 18th birthday, Dad said, come on, let's take you out for your first pint, boy. So he went down to my local pub and he said, hello, Steve, is this your dad then? Took my, you know, took my tanker down because I've been drinking in there for about three years. Um, <laughs> We see back then, and this is relevant to what I'm talking about, back then the local police officers all knew me because my dad was one of them. And more importantly, they knew if I was in the pub at 16 years old, you know, with my pocket money being only able to afford one pint and five straws between us, if we were in that pub, they knew we weren't out causing trouble anywhere else. So they tolerated it. They tolerated us being a little bit naughty because it stopped the greater naughtiness that would have happened if we'd been outside and done other things. So anyway, we, we went for this drink, and he said, what are you going to do with your life, boy? And I said, oh, I don't know, I'm thinking about art college, thinking about catering college, not sure which one to do. And he said, well, you know, shame you don't think about being a policeman. And I said, why is that? And he said, well, you know, good life, pension, all those sorts of things. And of course, you know, 18, you're thinking 30 years ahead, I'll be dead by then, that's an old man. 48? God, I wish I was 48 now. Uh, anyway, the, the fact is... The fact is, I thought, what the hell is he talking about? Bloody policeman, pension. I thought, besides, he's been nicking all my mates for drugs and things. And he goes, which mates? And I said, no. <laughs> I said, look, I, I don't want to be a copper. It's not my thing at all. And he said, well, yeah, just take a certain kind of man. Ooh. <laughs> oh. I said, well, what sort of man? I could do it if I wanted to. No, I don't think so. 
Anyway, the beer kept flowing, and the, and the conversation continued and got more desultory and more accusatory. And I woke up the next morning with a stonking hangover and a piece of paper in my pocket, which apparently suggested I'd accepted a £50 bet with my dad that I couldn't survive six months as a cop. And to add some, you know, uh, some gravitas to it, it had been signed and witnessed on the back by two other people, as if that made any kind of difference. <laughs> but anyway, I thought, why not give it a try? I've got... As it, I'd got placements at Catering College and Art College, but they, didn't, they weren't going to happen for another nine months. And I thought, six months, I can do that. And I'll tell you what I do, seeing as my best mates have all got out of Cornwall, and they've gone to that London, I'll go there and see some bands, because you didn't get rock bands in Cornwall in the 70s. If you want to see live music in the 70s, it was people in fair ass sweaters, singing out of Sailing Out of Liverpool, Never to Return, or, or you know, close harmony male voice choirs. And in fact, my favourite is called the Apollo Male Climax Voice Choir, which I think is a fantastic name. Um, <laughs> I don't think they've quite realised how badly they've named themselves. But, so I thought, I'll apply to the Met. And the Met was either desperate or short of numbers or whatever, because I got in. I got into the Met Police and I joined on the 18th of February, 1980. And I turned up at Hendon Police College, bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, thinking this is going to be a great six months, I'll see a bunch of bands. I can, I can swan my way through this. And right from the outset, I realised that there was something really strange going on with policing. You see, I'd grown up in Cornwall. And uh, see how this works. Now, on the left is what I thought policing was like. <laughs> I should say, I did a talk called The Skeptical Bobby, which I took all around the country a couple of years ago. And on about the 90th time I'd done this talk, someone, and it was an advertiser, said, what's that boy doing? No one had mentioned it up to then. Oh, no, no fire service, no NHS staff, no one. But an advertiser said, what's that boy doing? Of course, he's crying. <laughs> because he's lost, or something's happened. But, um, or the policeman's propositioned him or something. But anyway, <laughs> the point is, that's what I thought policing was like. And what I walked into in early 1980s London was policing as it is on the right. It was like I'd been taken out of this comfy little cotton wool cot in Cornwall and thrown into a bloody war zone. There were riots all the time. Uh, I was at Brixton, I was at Southall, I was at uh, Tottenham. Um, in Tottenham, I was very lucky to walk away because the shield, the, the, the copper with the two shields, two down from me, got hit with a shotgun. It was an extraordinary time. There were IRA bombs going off once a month. We kind of forget this with all the recent terrorist activity that's going on in London. People say, oh, terrible, terrible. You know, we should ban everyone who's a Muslim. We should ban this other thing. You know, back in, the, back in the 70s and 80s, we banned everyone who was Irish. You know, the biggest terrorist bombs that ever hit this country were all from Ireland, or people who were sympathisers with the, with the IRA at the time. So it was like walking into a war zone, and I thought, why is it so different? Why is London so different from Cornwall? Now, I'm not just talking about the scenery here, I'm thinking about the people. Because in Cornwall, I lived in some quite big towns. I lived in places like Penzance, I lived in places like Helston, I lived in places like Truro. They're quite big towns. Truro is even considered a city. Although it's not really. It's got a cathedral, which is incredibly big and looks stupid in the middle of the town. And that's the only reason it's called a city. But nevertheless, these are quite big towns with quite large populations, very similar to quite a few little places on London boroughs. And yet the difference was, was, was striking, the fact that in Cornwall you'd maybe see one or two cops during, during the week. You know, you see one or two cops, because they weren't only covering the town, they were covering little outlying villages and things as well. And yet, there wasn't much graffiti, there was hardly any litter, there wasn't any trouble, you didn't feel unsafe going out at night. And yet, I came to London, it was exactly the opposite. And I thought, well, people are people. Surely, it, it must be something to do with the geography. It must be something to do with being in a city makes you act in a different way to the way you live in the country. And what I quickly realised, it's something I'll come back to in a minute, the big difference was how fractured the community was. Back in Cornwall, we, there, was a very, there was a very tight community. I mean, part of that was because people didn't move out of the area very much. You know, you were born, you, you met a partner, you got married, you had kids, and you died in the same town quite regularly, or at least in a nearby town. People didn't tend to migrate very much, whereas in London, a lot of people were coming into London from different areas. And there was a kind of reticence for people to get to know each other, unless they ended up going to an area that had sim people from a similar sort of background to themselves, and then you get these little sort of for want of a better phrase, ghettos, where there's certain areas that you know are Jewish, or certain areas that you know are Sikhs, or certain areas that you know are Japanese, etc. So that was the first thing. But the second thing was that policing with a small p is how Cornwall operated, because everyone was part of policing. There was no, 
there was no disconnect between the police and the public. If, if someone in the, in, the, in the general public saw something happening, they would not think twice about phoning up, you know, that nice Mr. Policeman and telling them all about what was going on, and the policeman would listen. Whereas in London, it was completely the opposite. People quite often didn't even know their own neighbours, let alone, you know, get in touch. And there wasn't a local police officer. All you ever saw was red and white cars going vroom, vroom, vroom with blue lights on the top going past your street. You never saw an actual cop on the street. So that was the first big thing I saw, and I thought, there's something wrong here. The second big thing, should I be aiming this anywhere in particular? Over there? No, no just into the ether, right? Um, the second big thing was this. Um, can everyone read that all right? No one got any sight problems that I can read it out to them? Okay, when, when policing was first rationalised, when it was first turned into a professional job, a career, um, they took into account Sir Robert Peel's Peelian principles, which was a set of, of rules he'd made up for what policing should be for and what it was about. And a guy called Sir Richard Main, who was one of the first commissioners of the Met Police in London, was given the job of coming up, if you like, for, with a mission statement for what policing was for. And the very first opening paragraph of that statement is that the primary object of an efficient police is the prevention of crime. Now that, to me, made complete sense. If I was to take a, a, a straw poll of this room now and say, would you rather be burgled, but the police are really, really good at catching bad guys, and the courts you know, will give them a good hard punishment, and they'll go to prison and have a really rotten time, or would you rather not be burgled? Most people, it might be the occasional masochist, but most people would rather not be burgled. Most people would rather not have crime happen to them. And yet, at the same time, there's this, there's this weird sort of morality thing going on where we want to see people punished. We want to see, you know, bad guys get punished. But the thing is, if you stop people from being bad guys in the first place, you don't have to punish them because they're not bad guys. They haven't been able to operate. And, and the thing that struck me was that if you could stop crimes from happening first, there's a whole lot of knock-on effects. But for a start, you don't get the, you don't get the hurt and, and the loss that comes with being the victim of crime. You don't get other knock-on effects, such as um, you know, medical treatments uh, for people who've been injured or people who have to have counselling and all these sorts of things. Insurance premiums don't go up. You know, and, and plus, people feel safer in their homes. You know, there are so many benefits from stopping crime from happening. And yet, what I found at training school at Hendon, I spent 16 weeks at Hendon doing my initial training, and during that 16 weeks, four months, there wasn't a single picosecond of that time denoted to prevention. Everything was about catching the bad guy. It was all about um, the, the definition of law, your powers of arrest, uh, the use of force, court's procedure, how to write your evidence properly so you don't lose the case at court. It all seemed to be a case of assumption that crime is going to happen. All we can do is be really effective at cleaning it up. And I thought that was something that was fundamentally wrong. And if I went back to the foundations of what policing is about, it was fundamentally wrong with that as well. And you'll still find this on the front page of almost every police force website in this country, or police services, I should say, these days. Uh, almost every sort of website that belongs to a police service in this country, you'll probably find this somewhere, or you'll find some of the Peelian principles, because they're still held up as these, these tablets of stone of what policing's all about, even though it seemed, certainly in London anyway, they weren't sticking to it. What they were doing is only dealing with the mopping up afterwards. And I started asking questions why this was, because there was something Ed said earlier about, you know, um, You've got to live with risk of being wrong in order to get the benefits of, 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 of being different and then finding out you're right. And you've got to occasionally be a little bit lonely. But I thought, I'm only here for six months. I'm only here for six months, and I'm going to get 50 quid off my dad. I don't mind rocking the boat a bit. I don't mind asking questions. And I tried doing things a little bit differently. I started going out onto the street and trying to do some things to try and prevent crime from happening. And I got some really good results in my first two or three attempts at trying to reduce burglary on a particular housing estate, I got a reduction of between 20 and 30% of burglary. Just by giving out some good crime prevention advice, changing people's behaviours about the way they lock their houses up, uh, and these sorts of things. And I thought, this is really, really good. According to the police service, I was the worst cop imaginable. <laughs> because there's two things here. The, 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 it all comes down to measurements. It's really hard to measure prevention. It's really hard to be able to stand up in front of your chief superintendent, who's then going to go up to their commander, up to the chief constable, up to, ultimately up to the home office, to be able to say, we, present, we prevented 20% of burglaries in this street, because they'll say, how do you know? 
How can you prove that those 20% of burglaries would have happened if you hadn't done what you'd done? And how do you know that it was your activity that caused that 20% drop? How do you, how don't you know? Maybe the burglar was on holiday. You know, maybe, maybe the most prolific burglar in your area has suddenly decided to go into car theft instead. How do you know these things? And I sat down and I read lots of books about how you could measure these things and found that measuring it was actually... It wasn't impossible, but it was very time-consuming and used lots of resources. Whereas something that was really, really easy to measure is how many arrests you had, how many stops and searches you'd done, how many times you'd appeared at court, how many convictions you'd had. And those easily countable objects were the measures by which police officers were judged to be effective or not. When, in fact, the, the, the bizarre situation is that, that in order to prove that the police were doing their job properly, villains had to be good at their job because they had to be able to do the crimes so that we could catch them. And this is, this is the ridiculousness of the situation that existed, but it was very difficult to try and change that whole mindset. I tried. I, I read lots and lots of books. Um, Hendon had a really, really good library, and, and a great librarian, a lady called Sue Clisby, who would, who would actually say, oh, I found this thing this week, Steve, have a read of this. And whenever I was up on a course at Hendon, because I'd been posted out to my station by then, and I'm walking around the beat with my funny hat on, um, and every time I went on a course back to Hendon, I'd go and visit her in the library, and she had photocopies of all these pages of different documents. And, and one of the ones that really changed my life uh, was a book written by Herman Goldstein called Problem-Oriented Policing. And what Goldstein, who was an American academic, what he'd advocated is a complete switch around of the way that policing was done. What he was saying is, and you think about it, it makes complete sense, is instead of constantly responding to the problems, what about finding out what the problems are and getting rid of them first? Now, it's very common sense to most of us. You know, it, 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 if you apply a sort of medical um, uh, story to this, you know, it, you, can, you can build hospitals, develop drugs, you can uh, train doctors and nurses and do lots and lots of things to tackle uh, a disease like malaria, or you can find out how the vectors are spreading, you can find out where the mosquitoes are coming from, and you can bomb the pond. You know, destroy the problem at source, and you don't have to have all those other things. And it was the same with this. I thought, if you can stop the problems from happening, stop the crimes from happening, you don't have the knock-on effect, the ripples that go out from that crime taking place, and people feel safer. So I started bringing in lots and lots of different ideas for this. Simple little things, like taking your neighbor's bin in off the street if they're not at home, and you are. Oh, my counter's reading 0, 0, 0, 0 now. Ooh, does that mean I've run out of time already? I have no idea the timing has gone off. Um, <laughs> technology. Um, anyway, the, uh, just simple things like that. You know, burglars will look at a street on bin day because everyone puts their bins out overnight or first thing in the morning. And at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, the only bins still out on the street are the bins belonging to people who aren't at home. And they've all handily got a big house number painted on them. So they've only got a case of street for two or three weeks and they know which houses are empty on bin day. The simple thing of getting your neighbour getting friendly with your neighbour and saying to them, would you bring my bin in if you're home? Just take it off the street level, past the curb, onto their property, and suddenly that house becomes less of a target. There's so many little things like this you could do. Thank you. I also discovered, um, you know, which again won't be any secret to you guys, is that carrots work better than sticks, particularly those kind of sticks. You know, if you, if you want to get people to, to do things, then the best thing is to engage with them and ask them to help you and, and try and push them towards something that they'll find mutually beneficial. Um, I'm going to end with a story, and it's this story, just to show how all these things came together because you can't possibly encapsulate 30 years of this. I should say, I got my £50 pound off my dad. I bought a really bad guitar on someone's recommendation, but I thought, do you know what? I'm enjoying this so much, I'm going to stay. And I kind of stayed for 30 years. So um, I ended up doing 30 years with the police and then made the career jump to writing QI. Obvious career jump, but hey-ho. Now, just a story that encapsulates everything I've been talking about. I was asked, in time, I spent about 20 years going against the flow and my own force telling me that I was an idiot and I was wrong and I was a bad police officer and getting bad reports. Then it was a bit of a sea change in the late 90s, possibly because of the stuff that was going on in America with Rudy Giuliani in New York and various other places. And I suddenly got the go-ahead to try some of these things officially. And in fact, they put a group of us together who thought the same way, called us the problem-solving unit, terrible name. People would come in the office all day long saying, I can't give up smoking, my wife doesn't understand me. Um, I think they thought we were some sort of counselling team, you know, but um, that's probably got problem-solving unit on the door, you know. Oh, God, I can't give up alcohol. Um, 
But we were, we were parachuted into various places to look at problems of long-standing that didn't respond to traditional policing methods. And we invariably got results. We did things like using wizards to tackle street gambling. We did things like using lollipops to deal with noise disturbances after nightclubs, because you put a lollipop in your mouth, you can't shout. It's, and it worked. And the other thing is it, it reduced aggression, because blokes really don't look that threatening. They say, you look at me. When, it, when they've got a chopper chop in their cheek, you know? Um, but this is a story from Scotland, and we were asked by the, um, uh, the Scottish police to come up and do some training up there, and we saw this situation, which was problems of antisocial behaviour on an estate that's sort of over where that Nudstock logo is, and these football pitches weren't being used. This one was being used, this one wasn't being used. There was a kind of dual carriageway in the way, but there was a tunnel a little bit further down which they could have used. Um, and we talked to the locals, we talked to the police, and of course all the usual responses came out. Slap them with ASBOs, you know, build a bridge, which cost about half a million, build a new tunnel, well, why can't they use the tunnel down there? They're all lazy, they're kids, they won't walk that far, it's 100 yards. All these sort of suggestions came out, punishing, punishing, punishing. The stick approach. We thought, well, let's try a carrot approach. So we did something they'd never done, which was we talked to the kids. And what we found is there were three distinct groups, three distinct cliques within this group of kids. There was the young kids who would come and play on the pitches until they got kicked off by the middle-sized kids. The young kids would then go off and play football in places they weren't supposed to play football, or they'd just cause a nuisance. The middle-sized kids would play there till the big kids kicked them off. And then the middle-sized kids would go down to the off-license, get a bottle of vodka, a couple of bottles of Buckfast, they'd get drunk, abusive, cause problems on the estate. Then the big kids would play on there till the pubs were open. The big kids wouldn't play on anything other than the full-size pitch, because they're all going to be footballers one day. 30 seconds. So we thought, what's actually needed here is not fewer pitches or punishments, What's needed is more pitches. So instead of spending half a million on a bridge, we spent 60 quid on a pot of paint, and we did that. <laughs> and what we did, and we also gave them ownership. We made the little pitches for the little kids, and we made it theirs by painting SpongeBob round the walls. So ultimately, the big kids didn't want to play there because they were the baby pitches. The middle-sized pitches, we got a five-a-side five tournament going with the local community police officers and various other parties. We got, I got Tesco's involved in funding it and things like this. We turned it into a five-a-side tournament. It became quite a big thing. The big pitch, meanwhile, the big kids are the only ones who would use it because they weren't afraid to go through the tunnel and across the road because what we discovered was the tunnel wasn't being used by the younger kids because the big kids were using it as their place to hang out because they had nowhere else. All it took was talking to people, getting involved with community, chatting to people, trying a slightly more uh, adventurous approach to it, and then finding that actually the problem went away. No punishment needed. Carrots work better than the sticks every time. And that's kind of the theme of everything I did. And at that point, I'll stop. Thank you. <laughs> Two very quick questions. One yeah, quick. Do you think there's always a disconnect between the experts and academics and the practitioners in that practitioners always seem to have a lot of tacit knowledge? When my car was robbed, one of the people who came to talk to me said, we really, really hate those things where you stick a payment thing, pay and display. What's wrong with that? It advertises to everybody who wants robbed for a car how long do you expect the car to Oh, God, yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, that had never occurred to me okay, yeah. in 10 years that every pay and display car park was effectively a car thief's paradise. And now, you're going to talk either to thieves or to people on the ground, they all mm. know it. Oh, but the, the knowledge never goes on. No, I know, we had a similar thing when, you know, if you had an abandoned car, it would sit there for ages, and t until police put a sticker on it saying, police are where it'll be removed soon. And then people thought, great, and they just helped themselves to all the parts. <laughs> so by, by the time the police turned up to actually remove the car, there was just like a frame. <laughs> there was just a chassis sitting there on blocks, you know. Yeah, it's absolutely true. It, it never seems to work its way up, and I don't know why. It, it's, it's obviously a communication issue. And there is this really important thing of just really, often really, really big things are determined, I mean, determined by, by small things. Oh, very much so, and, yeah, yeah. No, so I'll, I'll take the one question, I love the top question, by the way, but I'll, I'll, I'll leave you to answer that later. Ha! Um, <laughs> okay. Um, but do you, do, you think zero, do you think zero tolerance, which was, um, do you think zero tolerance, which was focused on, essentially, you know, the path dependence of crime, that, it, that's, that focusing on what's apparently trivial, do you think that worked, or was it a coincidence? Zero tolerance works because, because every crime gets a punishment. That, that's, that's what zero tolerance means. Where it didn't work was in terms of disengaging the police and the community, because invariably the people 
who were being prosecuted all the time were, were the people at the bottom of the financial scale. They were the people who were, who were you know, stealing food because they were on drugs, or they were stealing food because they were homeless, or they were stealing this because, of, because they didn't have enough to feed their family. And these sorts of people would be hammered all the time, whereas the people at the top of the tree weren't. So it, it kind of created a lot of division in that respect. Um, where it worked better is where it, where it showed people that the little things matter. I, I mean, one of my favourite stories from Bill Bratton on the New York Underground was to try and deal with the whole issue of people jumping over the barriers and fair dodging. What they did is they set up snatch squads who grabbed every single person who jumped over a barrier, and then they daisy-chained them with handcuffs along the wall of shame, as they called it, so all the other commuters would go past and see them there. And then they interviewed all these people afterwards, and, and most of them were fairly respectable businessmen and women who would never dream of doing anything wrong, but the reason they'd done it is because they'd kind of been given the freedom to do so, because they'd watch so many kids jumping over the barriers and getting away with it, they think, well, why am I paying? So they were jumping over the barriers. Once, once that issue was dealt with, and once that issue was identified, and it's a little thing jumping over the barriers, it, it opened up the, the whole idea of how can we change the way the New York Metro works to make it safer, etc. And they did. They brought in lots of other things that they learned from talking to the people who were affected by what was going on. Fantastic. Little things happen, and they matter. Brilliant. Thank you very much. You're welcome, Dave. as always. always